this discussion is a really, it's a really important one, I think, for all of us, because it's all about what's happening with research around the world uh, in terms of getting these medicinal therapies to the stage where they can become uh, registered uh, medicines and therefore available through the health system. Uh, just a couple of comments to, to start with. Uh, I mean, the first one is obviously acknowledgement to, to country in respect of our indigenous population. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. We'd also like to acknowledge the elders, the wisdom traditions, the cultures and the communities who have used these medicines for thousands of years for their intelligence, wisdom and healing potential. I mentioned that this is an important session for us, uh, but I want to localize it uh, in Australia first so that uh, we, we contextualize what, why it is so important. And I'll just spend a few minutes doing this and then hopefully at that stage, Rick will be uh, on hand and can uh, start his presentation. So uh, key thing I want to say at the start is that uh, uh, my medicine Australia has nothing to do with the recreational use of uh, psychedelics. It's all about the medicinal use. That isn't to say that, uh, that uh, we don't think that there are problems with the legal system as they pertain to recreational use. We do. Uh, we think there's a, a great need to uh, 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 update the legal system so it's, so it's based upon risk as opposed to laws that go back 50 years. Uh, but as I say, my medicine is all about the uh, medical use of these substances. The reason that we're so keen to hear about hear from Rick about what's happening globally is the chronic nature of mental illness in Australia. And I can see Rick's now come on stream. Uh, so hopefully his internet's uh, working clearly. Uh, yeah, it, 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 the context for, for us all is the chronic mental health conditions in Australia. And you'll see there the figures pre-COVID, one in five Australians. I think just as uh, sobering is one in eight Australians on antidepressants and one in four older people and one in 30 younger people. And no doubt these figures are worse today because of COVID. Uh, I, I think without more, because of the, even apart from COVID, but because of the acceleration we're seeing in, uh, in, in, in life caused by technology and the, the resultant uncertainty, Without more, it's hard to see these statistics turning around. Uh, indeed, I think they'll get worse. Uh, when you go to distinct populations in Australia, and I've highlighted uh, the, the uh, Australian Defence Force veterans here, uh, the general population and statistics uh, look relatively good, which is a bit bizarre. Uh, you'll see there that mental disorders amongst veterans is, is, what, is, is almost one in two and comorbidities is way, way higher. Virtually on every level, our veterans who have gone out there and served our country uh, have, are faced with much worse mental health conditions. Uh, also extends to first responders and other, and other frontline people. Uh, this all causes obviously immense suffering in Australia and a massive cost. And I don't like, I've got to say, talking about economic costs because I think we need to solve this problem because so many people are suffering. But the reality is if we can get more people well and out of the system, hopefully we release funding to support people who for whatever reason aren't uh, supported by new treatments. The elephant in the room, which I've talked about time and time again, it's one that's not spoken enough uh, in Australia. And it's, it's simply this, that the treatments that we currently have just don't work with a large number of people. And you can see some of the stats there. Uh, with depression, uh, it's estimated only 35% of people go into remission. Yes, response rates are higher, but response rate rates, but response doesn't mean remission, it just means management of, of a condition. With post-traumatic stress disorder, even worse. Uh, remission rates estimated uh, by those who, uh, who work in the field in Australia as being less than 10%. Response rates higher, but again, response rates are simply managing the problem. So, you know, the thesis that Mind Medicine Australia works on is that uh, more of the same, whatever governments tell us, more of the same is not going to turn these terrible mental health statistics, statistics around and substantively reduce the suffering that we're seeing in this country. 
So what is Mind Medicine Australia? We're a charity, uh, really the same as, uh, as MAPS, which, uh, which Rick founded. Uh, we're there because we want to reduce suffering. We have no other interest. Uh, we're primarily focused on medicinal psilocybin and medicinal MDMA, simply because they're the most advanced in terms of trials, and no doubt uh, Rick will speak to that. For us, success uh, with My Medicine Australia is a situation where these therapies become part of our medical system, uh, that, they, that they achieve the high remission rates that we're seeing in trials. And really importantly, they become accessible and affordable by all Australians. You know, we would regard it as, as an enormous failure if these therapies were only available to people who were wealthy. That would be, uh, that would be an appalling outcome. So what are we doing? Well, we're focused on developing the ecosystem in Australia so that these therapies become part of our mental health system. We do it in four ways. The first way is awareness building, you know, making sure that regulators, politicians, uh, people in our medical and health fraternity, members of the general public understand just how prospective these therapies are. Uh, we also run a, a therapist training course. Uh, last year, we trained about, about 90 psychiatrists, psychologists, psychotherapists, and so on. This year uh, will, will be about 160. That's all about making sure that when these therapies become available, we've got people here who know how to use them in a, in a safe environment. The third element is engagement with the university sector. Why are we doing that? Simply because most research takes place in universities and most, an undergraduate training of, uh, of medical and healthcare professionals by and large takes place in universities. That led to the announcement last year of the Monash Neuromedicines Discovery, Discovery Centre, which is Australia's first centre of excellence in psychedelic therapies. And the last strategy is all about uh, uh, the, all the things we have to do to make these part of our uh, mental health system. So it's, it's, it's ensuring uh, secure supplies of GMP standard medical grade uh, MDMA and psilocybin. It's working through how clinics can roll out the, uh, the therapies. It's making sure we have the right regulatory framework to support these therapies and so on. And importantly, it's making sure that we don't make mistakes uh, because the last thing we need now is uh, uh, somebody being too loose in the way that they endeavor to uh, administer these therapies and a backlash developing. That would be, that would be appalling. Uh, how can you help us? Well, you know, we're a charity, so uh, I mean, the first thing is, you know, we thrive on or we exist on donations. Uh, there's also an ability to volunteer to work with us. Uh, but, but apart from that, you know, just go up, up, the, up the learning curve on these therapies and talk to everyone you come in contact with. Uh, it, it really is time that Australia took these therapies seriously and started to pave the way for their use. Uh, that's our certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies that's available to uh, people with uh, mental health backgrounds. Uh, we also run a fundamentals course, uh, which is developed, has been developed for a much wider uh, group of people, which is really the basics of psychedelic therapy and how it works. Uh, we have about 30 chapters around Australia. Uh, these, are, these are groups of people that believe in what we're doing and support us at the local level. That is extremely important. Uh, and we run a regular webinar series, and you'll see some of the some of the upcoming ones. We have extraordinary people from around the world who uh, who uh, give off their time to enable us all to be much richer in terms of knowledge about uh, the mind, the, these therapies, and the developing understanding of consciousness. So, uh, without more, I'm going to now introduce Rick, and I hope Rick's. Uh, uh, got his slides ready, uh, and, and what I'll do is make, make Rick the host. It's done. It's done. Uh, look, just to introduce Rick, and for most of you, I, I suspect Rick doesn't need any introduction. Uh, he, he did his uh, degree, he graduated uh, with a psychology degree in 1987. Uh, really interestingly, as part of uh, his undergraduate dissertation, he, he did a 25 year follow up on the Good Friday experiment, which many of you will know about, but it was an experiment into the potential of psychedelics to catalyze religious experiences. He also studied with uh, Stanislav Grof, uh, and I think was one of the early 
uh, graduates of the holotropic breathing work that, that uh, Stan was doing and is still doing. Uh, many of you would have been on the, on, the, on the webinar last year that we had with, uh, with Stan, Stanislav, which was absolutely brilliant. Uh, Rick established MAPS in 1986. It's 36 years ago, so uh, he's got extraordinary tenacity. Uh, and he established it with the goal of making MD, M, MDMA into a registered medicine so it could be available through the medical system. Uh, he's, if, I, if, if I can say, you know, he really is a legend in the psychedelic world. Uh, enormous tenacity, enormous determination. So Rick, very much looking forward to, uh, to hearing from you about what's happening around the world. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. And I'm really um, privileged and glad to be here. And uh, uh, we are at the very important uh, openings all around the world and how we're moving forward with regulatory agencies. And so I think thinking about things together and looking at some of the issues that are gonna to have to be addressed. And um, I, have a, I do have a presentation, I'll show you where we're at, but I think there's also um, to think about th this, um, the goals, the goals of um, maximizing patient outcomes, which is what's got us here, but then also the uh, corresponding issues about scaling and, uh, getting into the questions of what are the minimum trainings for the therapists and how do you move that forward and how, how do you then um, move into other group settings and how do you get insurance coverage? So I think these are issues that we know we're all trying to address. Um, and there's a lot of just uh, trade-offs that are gonna be having to be made. So the more that we're uh, clear in our thinking about it and um, you know, for, for me, I think this uh, issue of uh, the slow rollout of something that's been of great um, controversy and concern and for which there's a lot of um, people uncertain about it, that the rollout of it is very important to be um, slower and more qualified, particularly at the beginning stages. So I do feel that there's $2 billion of investment money, plus here this movement towards uh, you know, moving forward as quickly as possible. At the same time, the need to um, work on drug policy reform, which is also quickly. Uh, so it's, it's a great challenge, I think, that we are at this cusp moment and there's a lot of different things to um, think about. And I look forward to um, thinking about uh, some of them with you right now. So um, get my uh, presentation up here just for a second. Um, okay. Okay. Um, All right. So, um, all right. So it's been 36 years of psychedelic science um, since the started maps. Um, this is from um, Alex Gray and his interpretation of the maps logo. Um, the most important thing to think about this is the um, the hands. It's people helping people with the um, psychedelic in the background, but this is really about the therapy, about humans helping each other. Um, psychedelics are the study of the mind, what the microscope is to biology and the telescope is to astronomy. This is really about the tools uh, that we need, and they have been controversial in the past, but now they are no longer. Psychedelics will help us that way. Um, Um, Carl Jung has talked about um, we have to study ourselves. Um, the psyche should be studied because we are the origin of all coming evil. Um, just this importance of looking into ourselves, the splitting of the atoms, change everything, save our mode of thinking. We shall require substantially new manner of thinking if mankind is to survive. And I think this new kind of thinking 
similar to uh, the astronauts. When we see our fundamental unity with processes of nature, the functioning of the universe, as I so vividly saw from the Apollo spacecraft, the old ways of thinking and behaving disappear. Um, and you know, we know our global interconnectedness through uh, global warming, through COVID, through molecules that can help us. Um, the theory of change affirmed by Robert Mueller, Assistant Secretary General of the UN, about this idea of um, fostering this global spirituality as being a, a key to resolving a lot of the conflicts that underlie a lot of other conflicts. Maslow moved from his hierarchy from near the end of his life. Most people are taught this still in school, self-actualization, but actually um, in the last years of his life, he moved to self-transcendence, the transpersonal, and just emphasizing the importance of going this way. Uh, um, we do have, in terms of cultural change, uh, police officers going through our training to learn how to give uh, MDMA assisted therapy to other police officers. And his police chief has permitted him to be filmed. Netflix is making a documentary of Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind. And so um, his receiving MDMA is going to be part of that documentary as a way to kind of tell a different story coming out July 13th. Great article in the New York Times recently about veterans of uh, PTSD. Uh, I think over time, um, legalization follows medicalization, but there are separate issues. This is a chart about the uh, use of medical marijuana and legalizing or legalizing marijuana for everything in the US. Well, more than 50% now, but I think the education comes through medicalization. Um, this was a great one. Marijuana went medical than mainstream or psychedelics in state Lucian. As the marijuana debate shows, attitude shifts that barely seem possible can sometimes become inevitable. I think we're not at that inevitable stage. That's why I think we have to be particularly careful, but I think we're close. This was uh, Timothy Leary um, back in 1990, um, encouraging me to do uh, research with the government and to work on it, although he did not want to do that himself. He was saying that that was really important to go through the regulatory system see how many new papers there are. It's just, um, is a psychedelic renaissance. Uh, many, many more clinical trials. Um, and they're working out. I mean, the data is really strong and there is very close working with regulatory agencies. Uh, the protocols are done really well. Um, I think that this is an emerging field for sure. There's just this whole range of potential indications. Um, there's 700 or so ketamine clinics in the United States right now. And a lot of those clinics are realizing that when you provide it with therapy, it's better than if you, uh, you don't. Um, uh, you know, maps our structure. We, we are um, 160 people about, um, 35 or so in the nonprofit started in 86 and 2014 started the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation, which is the pharmaceutical arm, which will be the uh, group that um, does the clinical research and also markets the uh, treatment by prescription, um, which is 100% owned by a nonprofit. So people donate to MAPS, get tax deduction, MAPS invests in the benefit corp. The challenge is now that the scale of resources that we need are so large that we have opened up to a revenue share that we are working with for investors for the first time. Um, but what it is, is investors in a um, share of revenue that is um, from the sale of MDMA in North America, um, but does not come with voting shares. And it actually ends after a period of time and it's a lower um, rate than venture capital. So it's, it's this middle ground. Um, we're hoping beyond that to um, find a philanthropic story. I think that's the real challenge um, going forward. Um, um, data exclusivity though is the good thing is we don't need to rely on um, patents or trying to um, block anybody. MDMA is in the public domain, the uses are in the public domain. Um, 
the incentives are that no one can use your data with exclusive use of our data uh, for a period of time. Um, other people can generate their own data um, if they want to. And what I think is we have such a head start with MDMA that chances are other people will be looking at um, other uh, molecules that they can patent. It will be similar, different in important ways. Public benefit model is we maximize treatment outcomes. We share the research findings. We try to be an ethical model. We support for profits. They're really important, but we also support the drug policy reform, harm reduction in the public, support personal spiritual growth, and also conflict between couples and cultures, even the yeah, Israeli-Palestinian study that Lior Roseman and uh, Robin Card Harris are doing, looking at ayahuasca and Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, MAP's going to be trying to look at MDMA, those kind of projects. So that's the public benefit kind of model. We've raised over 135 million grants and donations, for profits over 2 billion. This is the key of what we're doing. And this is the key to phase three and to the global aspect is this disagreement that we have with the FDA after the end of a special protocol assessment process that extended for about eight months after we got approval to go to phase three, where we negotiated all the aspects of the phase three design with FDA, came to agreement, um, and they're legally bound to approve if we get two statistically significant studies and no new safety problems arise. Um, and so we're working closely with the FDA and have this guidance and pre-discussed all the different parameters that they, they want to see. Um, so this is the protocol design. Um, uh, it takes about three and a half months. It's uh, three day-long sessions and 12 90-minute sessions. The day-long sessions um, either inactive placebo or you get 80 milligrams of MDMA followed two hours later by 40. Then people negotiate and most of them go up to the, over 90% go to the 120, followed by 60, 120 again, followed by 60. Those are three to five weeks apart. The two month follow up is for uh, the primary outcome measure. Um, we also do longer term follow ups more for insurance companies and to show durability uh, because it's labor intensive and it's a two person therapy team, um, not always, but often male, female. Um, and this is the basic uh, um, requirement for phase three design. Uh, each of two studies have to be 100 people each. Um, uh, then we've got the breakthrough therapy, and we've also done this to start talking about it globally with the scientific advice of the EMA. Um, they accepted the design with an inactive placebo and also um, required us only to have one 70 person phase three study because they will accept the data from the um, two studies in for FDA, which are also for Israel and for Canada. So that we have th the three country um, simultaneous uh, approvals and work in uh, Israel, uh, Canada and the United States. Um, and so the FDA as a main agency will accept data from outside the US, sub data. So the same way here in the EMA, they will accept the two, or the two phase three study data and in addition, we need a 70 person study. And before this in Ukraine, they request we enroll refugees and migrants. Um, we've already got the uh, starting to screen or completed um, in these cities. Um, and we're trying to um, negotiate separately with the uh, MHRA. The, uh, Medicine Software Products Regulatory Agency in England, and, um, as well as with European Medicines Agency. And also then you negotiate with each of the separate countries on the payers. Uh, will, will they cover it or not? And once you have FDA and EMA approval, you pretty much have um, the ability to go all over the world, except for Russia, China, and Japan. Japan wants uh, their, their isolated genetics. They say they want a phase three study in Japan. but. Um, China maybe would be open to it. Russia is close to this kind of um, work. Very much shut down ketamine research, even when it was helpful in alcoholism and 
for addiction in Russia is shut that down. So most of the world though is open up once you have FDA and EMA or one or the other is great, but both are pretty solid. Um, just, I only wanna say this about mechanism of action that you hear about all the studies that talk about um, the mystical experience, the depth of that for alcoholism, for depression, um, for OCD. And, and I think that is all true, but here in MDMA, um, we do not see the same mystical experience questionnaire. The score remarkably high, but um, there is no correlation. So that's also important as far as our um, approach. Um, here's our results that were published in Nature Medicine, um, New York Times. Um, Science said it was one of the top 10 breakthroughs of the year for 2021 um, as an example, but the leading example of um, phase three designs for um, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Um, we had 90 people um, in it because of COVID. Uh, we agreed with FDA to those. Um, Most of them were women, most from sexual assault, um, a fair amount of veterans and from other um, traumas. Um, one third of them, principal trauma occurred during childhood. Um, they had PTSD for um, 14 years on average, um, uh, more than a third for 20 more years. Um, they were the hardest cases that positive ideation. Um, Almost all of them, serious ideation, one third of and positive behaviors. Um, our results, the top is the therapy um, with inactive placebo. The bottom is the um, MDMA with the therapy as well. Um, both do pretty well, actually. Um, the therapy worked uh, so well. It also worked on um, depression and uh, uh, decreased functional impairment, so increased functionality. Um, highly significant, it, this is, um, it's not significant, uh, 0.05, it's one in 20, it is 0 0.001 is very robust, FDA really likes that, but we had 0.0001, one in 10,000. We did have 32% in the placebo group, um, no longer um, qualified for a diagnosis of PTSD, so not really placebo, the therapy group. Um, which is really pretty good. And in phase two, it was only 23%. Um, but with MDMA, you had it was 67%, um, two thirds no longer qualified for a diagnosis of PTSD. Um, an additional 21% had clinically significant um, reduction in PTSD symptoms, and there were some non responders as well, about 12%. Um, we don't have the one year follow up yet. But for the phase two, the one-year follow-up was good. People improved over time. So we're thinking that um, that, that might happen again. We don't know. Um, we'll be gathering the last data point um, in, uh, in October. And um, we'll, we'll have that information. Then in this study, dissociative subtype, the hardest people to treat, um, responded the best. Um, Effect sizes were very strong compared to Zoloft and Paxil. So what this suggests is that um, placebo subtracted 0.91, a very large effect size. But when you take it in combination, the way that it'll be delivered with therapy plus MDMA, it's 2.1, two standard deviations from the norm. So it's, it's really pretty remarkable. So I, I do think that these effect sizes, um, when coupled with um, this idea that we think we can really scale it, that, and this, this will apply to, I think, psilocybin, ketamine, other substances, that the therapeutic approaches um, are what really matter the most. And then you can do different things with the psilocybin or the ketamine or the MDMA, but that um, what we showed here is that there was no site effects, which means that the results were from 15 sites, but they weren't coming from a few sites that were the most um, qualified, highly qualified, and almost all the subjects came for there. And you know that some of the other sites didn't do so well or something. What we showed is that there were no side effects. So we, we think that what this means is that it's scalable, that the therapeutic approach with the combination of the MDMA, it, it is scalable. Um, from a safety point of view, there was a bit more suicidality in the placebo group, 
Uh, but serious adverse events, one person tried to kill herself twice, another person self-hospitalized not to kill herself, both in the placebo group. So it suggests that, um, that there's something difficult, very difficult, having you know, uh, severe PTSD. But that if you can um, work with it in therapy, it's, it's, it's um, hard for people to, to do, particularly when they, they place their hope in things. Um, so it, there's a background risk of, of um, suicide in this group of people. Um, and we hope to reduce that. Uh, in cardiovascular, um, no main issue was not a problem, but in the placebo group, again, we've not seen people try to keep self-administering the drug. Um, the main side effects were not much, this muscle tightness, decreased appetite, uh, sweating. Transitory, way more in the MDMA than in the placebo group, but really acceptable. This is a very important slide. This, this is um, a, a recent study that came out from the Veterans Administration that did a study in 900 people um, with prolonged exposure and cognitive processing therapy. MAPS um, superimposed our phase three data on top of it from our first study. So you can see the top line, the blue line, is the therapy without the MDMA. The bottom line, the red line, is the therapy with MDMA. So you can see it was the most uh, productive of the, the four options. You can also see up upper left that the, um, our group certainly higher, more PTSD symptoms, according to the CAPS. But if you look at the upper right, the dropout rates, um, the prolonged exposure and cognitive process had all, Prolonged exposure, 54.6%. Cognitive processing, 44.8%. Uh, and the only 6.5% dropped out of MDMA. So, uh, and even our placebo, because people had a lot of therapy in there and more, and also were able to, uh, if they stayed in, they knew they could cross over to get MDMA. But the, the dropout rates, so it's hard to confront trauma. I think it's very difficult for people and this MDMA helps I think uh, ketamine, psilocybin, and other things will help as well. But this just suggests again this um, on this. Uh, the hope is that it can be substantially reduced the dropout rates. And actually, we are trying to do studies to blend MDMA with prolonged exposure and also with cognitive processing therapy to see what kind of synergies there might be. Um, this interim analysis just happened a month ago, a little bit more than a month ago, and what we were. Um, trying to understand was um, how was the study going? Was it on track as we had designed it to be statistically significant? Um, the interim analysis takes place when 60% of the 100 or 60 people um, have reached the primary outcome measure, but all 100 had been enrolled. And then we're told the number, you don't need to enroll anybody, the study is done, or you can, um, you have to add more people because it's not, the effect size is lower than you thought, but you can add people. And if it's statistically significant, even a lower effect size, FDA will approve it. And so this is a way to help you succeed in your phase three study and agreed with FDA that we would have this analysis to help us succeed if we needed it to add more subjects. Um, or we would learn from this data monitoring committee to stop the study either for safety or because it wasn't working at all. So we were happy to report that um, we were told that we didn't have to add, had, add anybody. We're on track. We have uh, a 90% or greater uh, probability of statistical significance when everybody is through the study. And the last data point will be, as I said, October. And what we're hoping for is that the um, safety record will stay the same. We've had difficulties um, enrolling a representative streak of the American population, meaning we've been overrepresented by white people and underrepresented by people of color. In our first study, but our second study, we, we had 27%. In our second study, now we have um, more than half for people of color. So we're, we're doing better in that regard. Um, gender, it's been, again, pretty much two thirds women, um, one third men, a few more tra trans and non binary in the second study than before in, in that one. Um, and LGBTQI is substantial considering they're uh, represented in the population, how many of them are traumatized, but um, 
in our studies at least. It's been about a quarter um, and has stayed the same in both studies. Um, this is where we're, it's very important to think of um, and how this will be developing. And, and this applies also again to the approaches for psilocybin and even cane that this is the first time that we're blending MDMA, not with our own therapy, which we call interdirected therapy, but with cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy, another approach accepted within the VA and moves the therapy from the patient to the partner as well. And both are brought into the treatment. And so this is a, expanding the sense of who are you treating? This is more like a family unit or a diet. And so one of them has PTSD, it affects the other person and um, both get the therapy. And so now we've done this uh, with Candace, um, six dyads, both got, uh, the results were better than anything that they had before. Um, with either with reduction of PTSD or with um, strength of the relationship. And so there's a big study going on now in Toronto with 60 dyads, half and half cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy with or without MDMA. Um, there's efforts to bring this into the Veterans Administration and several different VAs in the San Diego VA and also um, the Phoenix VA and elsewhere. Um, so I think that this thought though of moving from MDMA assisted therapy, only one right way to do it are this interdirected, which is what we're using in phase three, is that other methods are useful. So in training therapists, it's, there's, there's core factors of, of respect and support, but there's different kinds of techniques that can be valid. And the way that we really are thinking to um, make this is the people that ne they need the training and the method that was used in the phase three or the studies to make it into a medicine, but then they should be free to modify if they want. Um, we're blending uh, MDMA with cognitive processing therapy. Barbara at Emory is gonna do it with prolonged exposure. Edna Foa, uh, who's now working with us on Israel to do a study, blend MDMA with prolonged exposure. Rachel here, this is a two versus three sessions. So these are, what, what I think I'm saying is that this um, institutionalization in the, and adoption within the VA in particular, but all, it is something that can um, have a big impact in um, sort of embedding this in a system that has over a million people with PTSD and disability. This, it goes to the enormous thing. And so um, what Rachel is doing is um, two sessions versus three sessions. Um, one year out, we, we, we believe that people, once the MDMA therapy is done, they can on average keep getting better on their own. And that that's what we were wanting to do. We're wanting to empower them to keep getting better on, on their own. So it may be that at one year, the people that have had two sessions are in the same place as the people who had three sessions, or, or maybe it's, it's not. Or, 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 but we do know, we think that the, from our data so far, that people do get better were more reduction of uh, PTSD symptoms after each. So three sessions are indeed better than two sessions. Um, and there would be more rapid change that way, but maybe that's the expense of the third session or... So it's kind of an interesting, very important study that she's doing and it will relate to how complicated or extensive the treatment needs to be. I personally think that three sessions is the best model for most people. We did administer it inside the VA on October 12, 2021, after about 30 years of trying. Um, this group therapy study will be starting at the Portland VA. Um, we're, we're talking about um, a series of um, humanitarian studies that we're trying to work with, with people in um, Somaliland, Armenia, South Africa. Um, we're, we're working with um, when it can be done, something with Ukraine. Um, and, and so we're going to need different models in different, uh, when we really talk globally, there, there's a lot of cultures that don't have really much uh, psychiatrists or psychotherapists, but they have enormous amounts of PTSD. And how do we work with them in, and I, I think it'll be more in group settings and that we'll need to look at very closely at that, but this is now just um, our very first movement into group therapy, which is um, three cohorts of six. Um, it'll be four therapists for six uh, vets with PTSD. So um, 
we'll see about the adjusting ratios over time. And also important is that each uh, person is having their first MDMA session by themselves, uh, an individual session before they do it together in a group session. So it's, it's a very cautious uh, move into group therapy. Um, this is just a joke about Halloween group therapy and what people might be saying. Um, this, this is um, this important study on um, really looking at taking a PTSD patient into a brain scanner while they're under the influence of MDMA only for an hour of the MDMA session. But this is also, uh, there is, there's gonna, there is an a, a enormous amount of now research being done on mechanisms of action. And I think that's really gonna be spreading. The study that we did with social anxiety and autism, adults in the autism spectrum is another point where a lot of people can do it. Life-threatening illness, there's so much moving forward, particularly with psilocybin now with this, that, um, and, and I think the move is gonna to need to be a little bit more into, or, or eventually move more into hospice settings at the end of life. Not Anxiety, but people maybe at the very end of life. Um, other studies in the alcoholism. Um, I really think that there's um, pan diagnostic, lots of different things. A lot of these people in Ben Sessa's study were um, running from unprocessed trauma. You help them process the trauma, and then that. So I think the, we're going to see uh, an enormous uh, increase in the clinical indications once some of them are approved that it's, it is really trans diagnostic and it's also trans. And a substance, so it will evolve to this. You know, psychedelic medicine. People will be cross-trained again. MDMA for eating disorders. You know, we're moving more and more into um, meditators and working with psilocybin. This incredible study, the movie uh, "Descending the Mountain." If you, have, uh, you haven't had a chance to see it, it's incredible about this. Uh, uh, let's see. Let's see. Sorry for. Um, yeah, it's, it's this kind of um, coming together, I think, of science, spirituality, meditation, communities is, is going to happen increasingly. Um, huh. Oh, yeah, this conflict resolution kind of research is going to happen more and more. Um, but how is the REMS going to be? Um, what, what we really think it should be, and this will be um, decided by each country, each regulatory agency, exactly what it'll be and how um, it will be done. But I think it will be based a lot on similar principles. And I, I think the main principle here is that the treatment is not the drug. The treatment is the therapy and therefore enhanced by the drug. So there needs to be a prescribers and safety screening for people who are going to receive this medication. And so we believe there'll probably be um, a two to four hour training program for prescribers who will do medical screening and who will um, be on call during a medical session. And then there will be um, the people in the room and the, the number of them or the training requirements will vary in different places. And we're negotiating out of we, we do use a two-person team. A lot of people are moving towards one-person team or, or groups, but uh, but that it's only administered under direct supervision. It's never take-home medicine. It's not telemedicine. It's only that way. It's only administered in certain clinics with a centralized pharmacy that has a list of who's been trained and which therapists and probably patient registry may or may not be, and um, potentially even a lifetime limitation on doses. Um, we did have a big dispute with FDA, and I think this is a really important uh, for the entire field. We want to give MDMA, we, we think therapists should be able to volunteer to receive MDMA as part of their training. And uh, that's a big part of their training. And it's, it's um, so we have a protocol to do that. Um, FDA put a clinical hold on it for a long time. Then said also that uh, the uh, lead person of the two-person team needed to be MD, PhD, and also not just a physician on call, but a physician um, right there on, in, on the site, which would have increased costs, not increased safety. And so we actually ended up 
spending a quarter of a million dollars on legal fees for people who specialize in formal disputes with FDA. And um, we were able to persuade the senior leadership of FDA that, that, um, that we made a scientific database evidence-based case. And so we got permission for the protocol. The lead person just needs to be licensed to do therapy. The second person currently needs um, a thousand hours of behavioral health experience um, or in a program to get a license. And the physician just needs to be um, on call. Um, we are screening more um, therapists from um, minority groups uh, and giving scholarships and trying to bring them into training. I think globally that we need to really think about the training of um, you know, people from all different cultures in their contexts, um, if we can, to, to try to keep um, ethical behavior uh, during this uh, rollout, which has already been a challenge. Um, with one of our um, uh, research therapists uh, engaging in unethical sexual misconduct with a patient. Um, it's uh, important to try to think about how do we uh, make things like that um, not happen? How, what do we learn from them? How do we go forward? So one of this is this um, code of ethics that we are teaching everybody um, as they go through the training, uh, a patient bill of rights will be um, given to um, patients, including where to report to uh, anything. Um, trying to, um, as the FDA, take a really good look at um, adverse events. And I think that's gonna be a, a critical aspect of this is really um, you know, adverse events monitoring. Um, this is just to illustrate that um, it will be psychedelic clinics, not just, um, here's an MDMA clinic, here's an ketamine clinic. Right now it is, here's ketamine clinics. I think the ones that are already doing um, therapy with the ketamine will evolve into the ones that also are cross-trained in MDMA and psilocybin. And I think these are the ones that people are gonna wanna go to wherever they have it to be. Um, I think just in the US alone, there'll probably be six or 7,000 clinics. I think there'll be um, enormous numbers of uh, clinics around the world as well. Um, that's reasonable, consider the number of people in this. Um, this is a, just our, our old timeline. It's, uh, we are still um, the top line, just as, you know, how we predict uh, when FDA approval and when DEA approval will happen. But the top line is right now, the um, October 2022 is the confirmatory data from our second phase three study. That's really the critical thing. The most re important reality check coming up is in October, um, the last data point in the study, if it is um, successful in the way that the special protocol assessment agreements um, required it to be, um, then the rest will flow um, according to some modified version of, of, of this. And so by the end of 2023, we think um, FDA, DE are scheduling their early 2024 um, and I think that psilocybin will be a year or so behind, and then this will be globalizing. Um, there's people doing ibogaine. There's people doing 5-MeO-DMT. Um, they're moving forward a lot. This, this is our, just in the United States, the bottom line is the number of therapists that we're talking about training. And it comes up, we want to train 25,000 therapists. Um, and these bars are about... Um, the number of patients. So we, we want to, in this decade, before this decade is over, our goal is to deliver 1 million MDMA therapy sessions um, in the US. Um, and the bar, upper line is the therapist capacity. We're not assuming that they do nothing but this too. So, and this doesn't count um, group therapy, um, but this is just a projection. This is based on a lot of assumptions, um, but that, that's the overall thing. And we are, um, required if we do succeed in adults to work in a pediatric population um, with 12 to 17 year olds. And we're actually given an extension in the data exclusivity. So I think that this is something that um, is where it's going to, to the closer to the source of the trauma, um, I think will be pretty productive. And I think we'll see more and more of this. Um, so I, I think we're, you know, we're gonna have this big psychedelic science conference in 2024 and um, June uh, 17th to 25th in Denver. 
the Denver Convention Center. It's kind of like the um, theme is kind of like the doorway to a new world of regulation and acceptance. Um, and so we think we'll have had um, our entire package of information to try to suggest MDMA should become a, approved as a prescription medicine for um, PTSD um, in adults 18 or over uh, before then. And we'll have a really good sense of that. So um, I'll stop with there and, and just say, um, I hope that I've given you some sense. I, I've really focused a lot on, um, you know, obviously on MDMA because that's what I'm working on the most, but I think that it's really the, um, um, the pathbreaker and that timeline will sort of give you a sense of, of what's moving forward. Um, to be with you tonight. Rick, thank you very much for that, uh, that presentation. I have to say, that every time I see a presentation from you, you seem to be advancing in leaps and bounds. And uh, <laughs> uh, this one is very encouraging. And I, I, you know, hopefully that, uh, that conference you talk about next year at Denver, which is gonna be enormous, will be a real celebration of, uh, of what yeah. uh, NAPS have, have achieved. Yeah. I, I've got uh, by the way, I do, I do see a question. What is happening in Australia? Um, which I'm sorry I have not mentioned yet. It's just that things are, uh, and maybe Peter, you can explain too, but I, I think there is, Australia's moving forward pretty well. It could be faster, um, but I think that it's moving forward solidly with a couple studies with psilocybin, with MDMA, um, with some with government money. I, I'm impressed um, by what's going on with Australia. Yeah, it's come from a long way behind and is now... Uh hopefully in the pack and hopefully going forward, it'll take a leadership role in some areas. Uh, that government money came from uh, Mind Medicine Australia, basically taking these concepts to Canberra and uh, the then health minister getting excited by uh, the potential. Mm -hmm. Just if I may, just um, a couple of questions. And then I think Tanya's on the line as well. And Tanya's going to coordinate uh, questions from, uh, from the chat. But okay. you highlighted earlier on this whole issue of exclusivity. And in Australia, the exclusivity period is five years. And you know, boy, has MAPS deserved exclusivity given the efforts it's put into MDMA-assisted therapy and uh, the money that it's had to raise to, uh, to do these trials. But the, one of the challenges that I keep trying to get my mind around is, is that if, if, if a singular party has exclusivity, given the pent up pressure in the system, from people who are suffering, does that enable scaling to take place quickly enough? I'd, I'd love you just to sort of talk a bit yeah. about that in terms of how you think about it. Yeah, that's great. That's a, uh, thank you. Yeah, so I think that the, um, yeah, maximizing patient outcomes and, and in terms of broadly thinking about that. But again, what's the treatment? The, the treatment is the um, therapeutic context, um, with the drug helping it. So I think that the scaling question is about how do we train the most therapists and how do we, you know, and then also what do we think about group therapy? So the exclusivity is about, um, <clears throat> it is, is not gonna be a limiting factor. What, what could limit it is if we're, and this, this is something that I guess we should talk more about, but what could limit it is that um, we do not want to be the only trainers of therapists. So what we need, so here, how I would imagine that, that other, we are now starting to authorize other groups to train people as well. And so what it, and, but it grows out of the um, actual research sites where people have had experience with MDMA, with, um, PTSD patients, and then those are the ones that we think are the most qualified in a way to sit and, um, you know, train other therapists um, because they've been through it themselves. So we're, we're starting with Naropa, with CIS, you know, is that we need to um, basically develop a set of core competencies that are specific to MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD, specific to the protocols, and then embed those and what in other training programs, and ideally also in schools of psychiatry and psychotherapy. And so that 
the training we really want to be a um, stand, you could say a standardized level of training, but we want as many places to um, deliver that training as possible. So I think that that exclusivity um, You know, it's in everybody's incentives to do more more training, and so I don't think that if there was a, um, I think that resources also, yeah. The, the the other the other part of this is that there are um, the big challenges. I start trying to say at the beginning, the big challenge is: Are we going to get the next uh, um, funding, which is excess of hundred million, let's say, um, from investors or donors, and and how does that affect if at all, you know, what we're going to do. So I think the, the thing about exclusivity, I think there's a good thing to incentivize other companies to develop new molecules, to tinker with the MDMA molecule, and to try to see if they, there are some ways to make, make it more useful, and, and who knows. Um, so I guess um, it's kind of a long answer, but, but I, I do think that the um, exclusivity serves a purpose to help to marshal resources and everybody's incentives are aligned. And I hope that one day that um, we'll have enough people in Australia that have uh, worked with MDMA um, with PTSD patients, and then they could um, become part of your course that then we could authorize it to graduates. So that we're also, you know, past the first part of our training program. So th that's how I think we could work together to scale it. And, and, and also the group therapy, that's really where we're going to learn a lot. Now, that's very ex exciting. And you, you may know that we've got a, a healthy persons trial coming up with uh, up to 100 people doing MDMA, and we're doing it in groups to really understand better the group dynamics. Uh, just a second mm -hmm. question, if I may, just very quickly. Uh, Rick, the other thing, I mean, I think it's extraordinary what you're doing, and it's incredibly exciting. But one thing I'm, I'm terrified about is that these therapies become the, the province of wealthy people. How, mm, do you yes, think, yeah. how do you think about the cost element and de effectively democratizing this so that anybody can get access yeah. to it if they need it? Well, well, the first part is it should be legal. People should be able to buy this on their own for like 20 bucks or something like that. I mean, there should be a medical product that is way more expensive because it took way more to make it into it, but it's covered by insurance. So we should have national health insurance that would cover it as medicine. And then ideally, that's how you democratize it. If everybody's got insurance, it's covered by insurance then, but that isn't the case. Um, so the part that we're talking about, a lot of it is uh, peer support. There is limited, uh, we wanna train people from different cultures. We mm -hmm. want to train um, people, um, it, we're, we're starting more educational programs for um, people about how to, Prepare to uh, their own trips, how to talk about uh, helping peer support. So I think we need to embed in the wider culture this idea of um, how to use these substances wisely. And the other part is that we do need to try to get it um, you know, at a cost that can be afforded. And so one of the parts I like that I think we need, I want to try to keep the two-person team, but I would like it so that the second person is um, a student or an intern doesn't even have to have a thousand hours behavioral. They're, they're like working for free to get this experience to move up to become more of a psychedelic therapist. So that would be at least when it's individual therapy, it would be good to have you know one person who's so that that getting to that point, um, reducing the cost. I I, I do not know um, how effective group therapy will be compared, but. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a critical question. Um, ideally, we would have national health insurance in the United States. So it raises the other thing about the patient assistance program. So what do you do about people that can't pay? Well, most other pharmaceutical companies, they'll just say, we'll give you a free drug. And it doesn't cost them that much to make. And then they've got the treatment. But for, for what we're talking about, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, we can give people a free drug. But it doesn't do them any good if they can't afford the therapy. So that means the patient assistance program should, for some people at least, provide the therapy at a $10,000 cost or something like that, even though the drug would only cost us uh, $100. So that gets into what do you charge for the price and what do you try to get from the insurance companies 
so then you can cover the people that can otherwise can't afford it. But I think the, the real check will be the legalization and trying to do drug policy reform simultaneously with drug development is the best answer, I think, for that equity question. Yep. Well, that's, that's an area we're, we're, we're pushing hard in Australia. But for everyone on this call, call from Australia, you know, please uh, let everyone know that you come in contact with, particularly regulators and politicians, just how prospective this is, how near it is, and this whole issue about equity in the system uh, to ensure that people can get access to this when it becomes legal in a way that's affordable, irrespective of where they're located and uh, economic uh, capacity. That, I think Tanya's yeah. just come onto the screen. I think Tanya, you're gonna coordinate that question from the chat. Yeah, so Rick, there's tons of questions. Just, just before that though, I'd just like to just, if you could put up your hands, those of you who are from Australia, if you could put up your hands so we can just see who is from Australia and who's from other nations, just now put up your hands from other nations as well. And who's um, not been on an MMA um, webinar before? Hands up if you've not been on it. Great, okay, well, welcome to all you newbies. <laughs> um, and Rick, it's just lovely to see you again and thank you for all your support for Mind Medicine Australia and for being one of our ambassadors. It means an enormous amount to us and we're very grateful thank to you. you. There are heaps and heaps of questions here. Um, Peter, you might also like to look at the questions and Rick, um, you can obviously see the questions there as well. Um, do you want to pick out some or would you like me to pick them out or how would you like to do that, Rick? I know. I, I, I and think I think it's if you could pick them out, which ones you thought were, and I'll scan them too. Okay, and but, we'll have to do super quick answers now because otherwise we won't get through as many as we could. So we'll do the quick dating formula. Um, so what discoveries in neuroscience would be the most useful for your work? <laughs> None, and that's a really interesting point. There is no <laughs> translation. Neuro, you know, translational neuroscience is, um, so far, it hasn't translated. So right. what, I, what I'm trying to say is that um, from the FDA point of view, that you have to prove safety and efficacy. You have to prove safety, you have to prove efficacy, but you, have to have, you don't have to have the vaguest idea how it works. Now, <laughs> the question is figuring out how it works is fascinating and it's good for making new drugs or whatever, but does it really help the therapists no, do better therapy by the fact that now I can tell you that the amygdala is, uh, has um, reduction of activity after MDMA and that there's enhanced activity in the prefrontal cortex and that there's increased connectivity between hippocampus and amygdala and that there's oxytocin release. Does that, when you teach that to therapists, does that make them better therapists? No, I don't think it does. So there's nothing that I um, think I would love to see some part of neuroscience that is translated. Now, here's another thing that's a bit frustrating. The um, DARPA, the you know, research arm of the US military, um, gave a, uh, I think, $27 million grant to people to develop non-psychedelic psychedelics for neuroplasticity and other things. That actually could be a good idea that, that you can have, um, you know, neuroplasticity without getting high, you know, maybe, we're, you know, so so that neuroscience, I think, can maybe figure out non psychedelic psychedelics, which could do a lot of things. So yeah, I'd look forward to what we can learn about non psychedelic psychedelics. But my main interest is in psychedelic assisted therapy, and I don't know that neuroscience will make a contribution. But I would love to be wrong about that. Okay, and then there's um, a question here about I'm very curious about long term follow up success. Yes. It appears there is a default understanding that all due to psychedelic experience and follow-up integration sessions, but is there any assessment, re-follow-up lifestyle changes and what part these play in positive progress? Um, we, we do um, gather some information about lifestyle changes, but, but it's, it's not um, a big part of the questionnaires and the long-term follow-ups. No, I mean, th there is a lot about, um, you know, jobs and uh, certain things, um, but um, it's mainly the long-term follow-ups are about adverse events and durability of um, PTSD symptoms, uh, you know, and also, you know, other benefits. But, but the other part is that we cannot say that it's due to uh, whatever we find due to the MDMA. 
all we can say is the MDMA was part of a process that opened people up to maybe try, try new things or, or not, but it was, it, hopefully it moved them in the right direction, but we can't attribute the, the results that we see in the long-term follow-up to MDMA. In the same way, um, it's, it, you know, people's life events are very difficult. And we, we do see that a lot of people have events that are re-traumatizing. Um, and, and hopefully they've become more resilient because of the therapy, but also they've had prior trauma. So I think that the long-term follow-ups are critical. And the other part that we will need to do eventually is to try to figure out how to predict ahead of time who's gonna respond and who's not to respond. So we do not really know, we do not really have a good idea of who's gonna be the responder and who's not gonna be the responder. Um, and if we can figure that out, then, then insurance companies now are, are much more interested in supporting it because they know that they can predict more of the benefits. But if they're you know, 85% responders, that's also pretty good already. Mm -hmm. No, you're doing a great job. And um, you know, it's hard to measure some of these things from any kind of, of treatment, of course, um, well, because we, you never know exact I, I, causality. <laughs> Yeah, but we, we have asked now, we're trying to do long-term follow-ups to some people that were in studies 15 years ago. So mm -hmm. we, we are trying to gather right now the long-term follow-up data from the very long term. Um, that's brilliant. Just, see, yeah, yeah it's, 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 you get so much, that's what we really need to know is, is what are the long-term effects. You know, the mm -hmm. short-term effects are, could be enough, but. Um, um, and this, this question, so, so as you know, Rick, um, Mind Medicine Australia and Mind Medicine Institute are doing um, a healthy persons um, study starting in, in a few months time with 100 people doing MDMA and, and 100 psilocybin in group therapy environments. These are therapists going through a certificate in That's psychedelic. Fantastic. Yeah. Let me just say that that is fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. It is very exciting. Fantastic accomplishment. It's uh, I, yeah, amazing. Yeah, and we're very excited about it. And for all of you who are therapists on this call, or if you know therapists, please encourage them to do the CPAT training because it's it's just a fantastic opportunity for people to actually try these treatments out in medically controlled environments, in a group environment as well with group therapy. I mean, I'd love to be a fly on the wall uh, in those sessions. It would be really fascinating. And there's a question here about you know, studies, I guess, in the US and Canada as well, there's been more and more studies occurring on benefits for healthy persons or healthy normal. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Um, And the question then is, do you believe these drugs will be made legal for these purposes anytime soon? You know, we often get questions like that. Um, so people, you know, wanting to just get the well-being um, benefits of using these medicines. <laughs> well, I think that um, the, the thing that is happening, um, you know, is the movement from the patient to the patient family members, you know, and they're technically not the ones with the diagnosis, but, but with end of life and with PTSD, those kind of studies have been FDA approved. To move to well people, you know, one of the ones that of course we're, I'm looking forward to many, um, is so important is the um, religious leader study that's about uh, psilocybin in religious leaders done by John, uh, Roland Griffiths and Tony Bosis at NYU and Hopkins. And so those, we, we tend to think maybe religious leaders are well, <laughs> we hope. Um, so the study in religious leaders of different traditions, um, I think that the, the studies and the benefits can be demonstrated in a lot of ways, but how do you provide legal access, you know, to, um, you know, to use psychedelics, you, you, you have to go through the legalization route or you have to do the research route. And so mm -hmm. I think that that's, um, the, or you can try to go through the religious route, you know, and religious freedom. And, and that is um, in general, what is, uh, or in specific too, that the religious freedom has been limited to groups. You have to be like Native American church or ayahuasca, or, or you know, you, you can't yet have your own individual freedom. Um, so you, you have to have that religious freedom in groups. Um, so I think that's not likely as a, you know, um, yeah. but we should try to move forward with that as well. But I think that the idea, not only is it about well people, but it's about preventative medicine. And if you can Absolutely. actually, 
Yeah. Okay. And not only that, and we haven't, I didn't really make much of a note of it, but that, um, you know, it's for mind body illnesses too. But I, I predict that it is 2035 when these things will be legal in the United States under a Everything. system of, uh, I think that we pretty much, every, all the psychedelics I think will be. Um, the others, I think we may, I think we will have federal marijuana in a couple of years for, and what, what, what that will mean is like 2025, 2026, maybe, um, we will have um, the federal government, what they did with alcohol prohibition and just say, we're out of it, it's up to the states. And we have a bunch mm -hmm. of states that have legalized. Um, I'm here right now actually in Montana uh, and that's why the uh, reception is not so good or wasn't so good at the beginning, but um, uh, you even have legalized marijuana here. But I think that what it's gonna take is a decade of psychedelic psychotherapy patient stories going through the culture that yeah and, and that's why we talk about a million ptsd patients and and so i think yeah. there's so much misinformation people need to hear stories from people that they know about the therapy having been helpful and that that i think will come over a decade or so and again i hope that i'm being conservative i'd love to be accused to be conservative um so i but i do think that it should be in a way that's called a licensed legalization and what yeah. i mean by that is that you think about alcohol i think alcohol is not regulated so well because you can uh, you know, get in a bar fight and then get arrested for that and go to jail and you can go to another bar or you can be a drunk driver and you can have, lose your license, but you can still go to another bar and another alcohol store. So I think that if you have a license, it's like a credit card. If you misbehave with the drug, well, you can't buy it so easily. There will be a black market. But so uh, I wish this idea of the, the well people, um, there will be people trying to press on religious freedom for individuals or you know, amorphous churches that you could join one day of, of the ceremony or something. Um, Do you have a sense a in, in Australia? Oh, I mean, just if you give me, uh, like Peter, like what is your sense in Australia about when things will be um, available legally for adults? Uh, the last thing I'll say is that I think that uh, children should be um, illegal for kids unless they get permission of their parents or guardians. Yeah. So there should be parental override of the drug test. Yeah, like a vision quest in the future, Rick. You know, like yeah, I love yeah. that idea of children going with their parents on a vision quest. You or, know, or a, getting permission to do it somewhere else, but still yeah. with permission of their parents. Sure, so. sure. Sorry, I just Rick's Rick, Rick's question. Uh, th th there are moves in Australia for decriminalisation, and the ACT, which is uh, one of our territories, seems to be leading the way. Now that's not legalisation, but at least it's the first step. Um, one of the challenges we have in Australia is we don't have a Bill of Rights. So there's nothing we can actually turn to, to insist on change other than lobbying and, you know, persuasion. Uh, and, you know, in that way, we're very different, for example, than Canada, which I think has been using the Bill of Rights or to, uh, to, to, to generate uh, some change. We're also in an incredibly conservative country. I mean, I, I shake my head at the level of conservatism in this country. And, and unfortunately, our regulators have a habit of thinking the best decision is not to make a decision. So how long do I think it will take to get legalization? I think you're probably right. We need probably 10 years of this being part of our medical system, favorable reports back, regulators finally getting convinced that actually, if it's used properly, it is safe. Uh, and then hopefully you know, it will be legal. But I think in the, in the way that you're suggesting that uh, there'll be some sort of registration or, or, or organizational structure behind people accessing uh, is psilocybin, MDMA, and so forth. Uh, so I think we're behind you, but hopefully we'll, we'll accelerate as people here get more comfortable. Yeah. Just, if I may, uh, a question, uh, you've talked a lot about MDMA and it's incredibly exciting and uh, it's really, uh, it's great. It's, it's an amazing accomplishment to get so close. Uh, hopefully 2023 is gonna be the year. But please just talk about the other psychedelics in terms of how long you think they'll take yeah. to become registered medicine. And, and also, each also one of just up. when you do that, um, Rick, also there's a question here, which is about ketamine being used as a pathway to gain greater acceptance of the other psychedelics. If you could also just briefly comment on that as well. Oh, yeah, well, that, that would be a good thing to start with, just to say that, um, um, 
ketamine, you know, S ketamine started out as classic um, pharma play to uh, take apart a molecule, patent it when it was the the S ketamine, the isomer is no better than generic. Then they use that IP to, to develop um, treatment into um, treatment of depression. They do that as a pharmacological drug without any therapy. That's how they think about it. Um, they charge a high price for the drug, um, but they had to spend a bunch of money to make it into a medicine. Um, and then they put it out to a lot of people who don't understand therapy, aren't doing it with therapy, and people are um, having profound experiences in different ways. Um, and so I think that the ketamine clinics that are there, more and more of them, they're realizing that they're a clinic, they're not the pharma company, that they should be focusing on getting better outcomes for the patients and that they are doing that and providing it with therapy. And that that will be incredible base for expanding into other clinics where they, they just add psilocybin and um, IV and five, you know, as they come along. So I think the, the ketamine is, the, the, the clinics that give ketamine without any therapy will, I think, fade away over time. And I think the clinics that will give um, therapy with ketamine, but also therapists cross-trained in the other modalities, and maybe then offer massage or this, like, you know, or, or just small private practices. Those are the practices where people say, I'm going to go to these professionals. They're cross-trained in the different psychedelics. They can really customize a treatment just for me. So I think we're, um, you know, the, the ketamine is very helpful. So when is the psilocybin gonna be ready? Um, I think that there's probably gonna be about um, two years uh, after us, maybe a year and a half, two years, something like that. Um, it takes a while to do the uh, phase three studies and then to go through the FDA process. So my guess is that uh, by the end of 2025, hopefully we'll have psilocybin one of these uses, either alcohol use disorder or a depression, uh, a, a major depressive disorder or a treatment resistant depression. I, I think the, the psilocybin is proceeding um, really pretty well. And that, um, yeah, within a couple of years, a uh, year and a half, uh, but before the end of 2025 is my guess for those. Um, the Ibogaine is starting to develop. Um, but there is such a need for Ibogaine in the sense that uh, in America, they had over um, uh, 100,000 people died from opiate overdoses, often mixed with fentanyl in one year. Um, and Ibogaine is um, moving forward um, in um, clinics in Mexico, elsewhere, outside of the US where it is technically legal, there's gonna be more and more of those set up. But the research itself, I think is probably five years away for Ibogaine. Um, it's, it's been really, um, there are more health risks. It's just at the beginning. Um, I think that 5-MeO-DMT um, has started to be used in some different research settings. There's really good supplies. There's excellent um, manufacturing. There's going to be um, really good safety data, I guess, uh, you know, from what I understand, when it's under supervision. Some people, it, it can shake people up. And so there needs to be real aftercare and support offered if it's necessary. Um, so I think that there will be um, any new molecules of which you hear a lot about are probably um, seven years away or more. Um, I mean, it's, um, it's a bunch to try to really understand that the thing about new molecules is that um, you don't have the advantage of old molecules is that um, particularly old illegal molecules that loads of people have used is that loads of people have used it. And so, you know, tens of millions of people have used MDMA or LSD or psilocybin. And, you know, so we have enormous track record of safety. Um, new molecules are new molecules. Chances are they'll be, you know, just, you know, very similar, but you never know. So the FDA regular, regulators are gonna want more of that kind of core safety data. Um, I think that there's gonna be um, some, unpleasant uh, patent fights ahead in this, that's gonna hobble um, psilocybin a bit. Um, I think that it would, um, or, or it has the potential to. So I, I think the challenge again is that it's so hard, you need a lot of money to make these into medicines. Um, it's hard to get it from, um, do you get it from investors or donors? So if you get it from investors, they all want IP and patents. Um, yeah. 
Hi, Rick. Except we found we figured out a, a different approach was through the royalty stream, which is in any case. Yes. No, I was just going to say there's quite a lot of questions here about training, and I know that you know I've had a lot of chats about training, and you said that it's necessary to create a pipeline. I think you said that you're going to train. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Something like ten thousand therapists over the next de decade, or was it twenty five thousand? I can't remember. Was it something like twenty five thousand? Well, it's twenty five thousand. Twenty five thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's twelve million PTSD patients in America. Twelve million. P the VA just raised the number from nine million yeah. to twelve million. Twelve million yeah. PTSD patients in America. Yeah. So yes. you know, with, with our um, <laughs> so with our CPAD course, which you're one of our wonderful faculty of. Um, you know, we're, we're, you know, we've already trained, trained, I think, a few hundred students and uh, Part, intake. Partially students. trained, but I would say partially trained. And that, that's yeah. what I'm trying to um, sort of, uh, at least into the point of, if training means they're ready to work with a patient, mm -hmm. you know, um, and even then we want to supervise them as they work with their first patient. But but I hear what you're that's saying. It. Yes, yeah. And that's part yeah. of it, by the way. Yeah, yeah well, that's absolutely. what you're talking about. This, this healthy volunteers. It's fantastic. Yeah, that's why it's brilliant. Uh, we, we have not been able to do something like that. Um, we, well, we, we do have two protocols to give in the UMA, but they're way more, um, I guess I would love to know how much science is around. What is your average cost per person? Because it's group therapy, you're, what is your, per, if you don't mind, I'm really curious, because our per subject cost for doing this kind of stuff is i don't i mean i don't know the answer to that yet but peter will look it up for you and he'll come back to you on that i'm sure um because we'd love to discuss it with you further but one of the the questions that we're getting on the chat quite a bit is you know that people um have financial need and i know that you're very big on equity as well rick and one of the things that yeah. all of you should know is that we have financial assistance places in our CPAC course. So if you're a person in need and you need financial support and you genuinely need it and can um, let us know why, then we'll do our best to support you um, at least partially with, with the fees for the course. But we do have like an incredible world-class faculty and I'm sure someone will put some testimonials um, in the chat shortly so that you can see what people are saying about the course. But Professor David Nutt recently described our courses as one of the best trainings in the world. And it is a really wonderful course and Rick will testify to that. And we really wanna make sure that there is a pipeline of trained therapists in Australia. And we're seeing that being a psychedelic assisted therapist or having that as an adjunct to your other clinical work is the most sexy sort of um, career move that people can make at the moment. And we encourage you, our closing date for our next two intakes is in about a week or so. So we encourage you to, to inquire, register, sign up as soon as you can. That intake's nearly full. so And that intake will enable you to be part of the healthy patients trial that we discussed as well. If, if you graduate, Tanya, it's, it's limited to graduates of the, of the course. Yeah. yeah. Really important. Yeah. And by the way, I, I should just stress, in terms of our ethics approval, yeah. it's, it's available to anyone in terms of eligibility, eligibility who's graduated from a therapy from a therapist training course in psychedelic assisted therapy. So it's not limited which includes to just- maths, Which includes maths training therapists. Well. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That is great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, it's, it's the, yeah, it, it's the nut that we've not been able to crack. So, but here's how we're going to do it. We think post-approval, just to say how important I think this is for the training. Um, and, and of course, yeah, we do have scholarships, and, um, particularly for uh, BIPOC minority people, um, although with other people just can't afford it also. Uh, but, but I think that um, it's um, so um, important that people have this uh, experience, the opportunity to volunteer. We would never require it. So what we're talking about is the label because we cannot knowingly sell for an off-label purpose. So the label itself that we should negotiate with FDA and the TGA and all, all the different is that the MDMA assisted therapy is for PTSD by trained therapists whose training can include one MDMA session. And then it's on yeah. the label. And we can provide it without any data, without any therapy, just like they're a patient. I think that's the long-term solution, but you've got this incredible situation. Yeah, I'm really I'm proud to hear about it. 
No, thank you, Rick. And look, just one other question. And I mean, this is something that we come across all the time, and I'm sure you do as well with your training and so on. So, you know, a lot of people will say things like, and this is Anita today saying, my concern is that having the training, not being able to utilise it for an unknown number of years in the future. Now, of course, Anita, what we want to say is you can utilise your training. So there's multiple trials taking place in Australia. We're also working hard to ensure that the special access pathway becomes functional in Australia, which it is becoming more so, Rick, in the US, the, the compassionate use schemes and yeah. so on. But what would you say to someone like Anita in that respect? Well, like, well that, okay, so let's go back to our data. You know, the, what we showed is that severe PTSD patients, um, chronic severe PTSD patients, 32% of them no longer qualified for a diagnosis of PTSD at the two month follow up from just from the therapy. So what I would say to her is that you will learn about a therapeutic approach that is pretty effective. You know, I think it's comparable to uh, prolonged exposure or to cognitive processing or cognitive behavioral therapy or, um, you know, so I think that you can put that therapeutic approach into practice right away. So the yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think that's one. And then the other is that um, there are more and more people who are um, finding ways to do this on their own and there's people wanting integration support, you know, people. So, you know, if you've been through, if you've learned more about it, I think, you know, you potentially could be putting it into practice by um, offering to help people integrate experiences that they have. No, absolutely. Or, or, and then go ahead. Or just think <laughs> about the ideas, just the fact that it's, it's so fascinating. It'll, it'll make you think about therapy in a different way. Well, that's right. And, you know, a lot of our therapists describe the course as the best professional development training they've undertaken because they're learning a whole range of different um, skills across different silos. So normally as therapists, people tend to stay in their particular silo, whether it's psychology or psychiatry or GPs. They're all coming together, learning from one another, learning about how to work with patients in altered states, which can also include holotropic breathwork or other meditative states, for example, that don't even involve any kind of medicine. And what we're also seeing from our graduates is that a lot of them are starting to set up clinical groups or set up trials together so that a lot of things are emerging from that multidisciplinary approach in the training by bringing together these multidisciplines in the training program, which I think is really exciting. Yeah. Tanya, I'm conscious that uh, we're sort of yes. coming up to full time. No. And Rick's uh, bedtime, no doubt, somewhere. somewhere. Oh, uh, if, if, no, if you ever uh, sleep. <laughs> I do, I do, but it's not that late here. So I, I could go a little bit longer if you wanted. Oh, okay. Well, that's fantastic. Peter, did you want to say anything else about, about the training or ask Rick anything? Or shall we just say... Oh, I, I, I think there's a bigger question I'd love to ask Rick if we've got time. And that is, you know, sure, sure. when you look at what's happening, it's, it seems to be going incredibly well. And all going well, we're going to have yeah. MDMA registered in America next year and then... Europe and so forth, and hopefully Australia. What keeps you up at night? Like, what do you worry about in, um, in terms of the work you're doing? I worry. Yeah, that's a really you know. So um, I worry about this. Um, the scale of the need is so great. Um, you know, one of the things we've talked about um, and haven't started really doing yet, but we just might, is trying to create a global index of trauma. So um, Bhutan has, you know, tried to create an index of happiness, and it has been used by different countries in the world. So it would be really good to try to think about, I think, a um, global index of trauma, and then how do we see if we reduce that? So all of that is just to say that the scale of the need is so great that. Um, the how fast you roll it out, um, you know, and the, the when is it enough for the quality of the training of the therapist. So I worry just most of all about this balance between about the training of the therapists and that the rate at which we um, prepare them, because this is pretty difficult work, particularly some deep suffering, and they kind of have to be, um, but on the other hand, if you provide a safe place, you know, people do a lot of their own healing, um, but it's, it's delicate. So I'd say right now, what I concern about is that 
Um, I, I believe between now and October, we have over 90% chance of statistical significance. So what I worry about is the safety. Will we have any adverse events? You know, the, the serious adverse events that we had in the first study were in the um, placebo group. Will, will we have any tragedies basically in the study um, before it ends? Um, so that, that's what I worry about. Then I worry about the rate of change of, um, you know, the, this kind of, um, for me at least, this question for us is where do we get the next large chunk of resources to globalize, to commercialize, to do um, some, to reach what's called the sustainability point. So what, what the big goal for us is that there is, a, we believe that um, MDMA assisted therapy for PTSD will very likely become a medicine, that we will have this period of data exclusivity. You say it's five years in um, Australia, it's, it'll be 10 years in Europe. You know, it's different all over the world. Um, there's, uh, and that there will be um, a value case because this therapy is so effective that there will be this value case that we can make to insurance companies and national health care. It will become adopted just because um, I think it, it, it really works and that there will then be this um, income stream that is um, from a sale of MDMA that will cover our costs to be doing new studies, new indications. So that's what we're calling the sustainability point. And so what really keeps me up this night is how do we get from here to the sustainability point? Um, we've added some incredible people to our board of directors of the Benefit Corp. Um, Jeff George, who is um, head of Sandoz, which is uh, 20,000 people, big multi-billion dollar generic manufacturers. Um, Dan Grossman for Boston Consulting Group, who's their pharma expert who worked with us. He's now on the... So we're um, loading up on um, expertise. Uh, and I, I think here's, I, I will say what, um, we have strong bipartisan support. I feel that we've really achieved strong bipartisan support. And I, I feel it's getting stronger, not weaker. So in an America that is incredibly partisan about pretty much everything right now, um, there seems to be this um, common ground on healing people with trauma who are um, not just veterans, as I said, two thirds are women, two thirds are sexual violence. Um, so I, I think that it's, um, I don't worry about a backlash for the drug war. I don't worry about a backlash against um, psychedelics. Um, you know, is there gonna be, what I worry about is um, um, the big trends in America, I guess, are we gonna keep democracy? That's what I worry about. But, but for what we're trying to do here, the need is so great, it's just how quickly do we um, try to address that? And, and, and where do we find this quality, quantity balance? Um, you know, because um, I think it will take 10 years. Of, it, society is still pretty, um, we're still pretty much in a bubble, I guess I should say. And that when we start to treat patients, it really, um, we need a lot of really positive stories. And I think we're moving in that direction, but, but I would say I worry about most is just this um, element of um, commerce versus compassion. Yeah, well, I, we, we, we share that concern, so I can understand. <laughs> I can understand that and uh, yeah. Tanya, because there's one interesting yeah. question about uh, uh, indigenous uh, knowledge mm. and expertise. Okay. And you want to just um, do that one and then, then we'll close off, Peter? Yeah. Uh, okay. It's obviously an important one because, you know, we, we have a, uh, uh, an indigenous population here and there's indigenous populations yeah. in your part of the world, South America, North America. And a lot yeah. of those indigenous population people have expertise in this area. When we talk about the use of medical MDMA and also psilocybin, it feels very medicalized. It, it feels very divorced from the, the knowledge base that's been developed over, frankly, in some cases, thousands of years. How, how do you think about this sort of juxtaposition of ancient knowledge with uh, medicalization? Yeah, well, I, I think that maybe there's a, a distinction that I'd like to make that is that um, it's about what you're talking about, I think is, is often about treating individuals. And this other group, this indigenous is group settings. 
pretty much, you know, so that I think what we're talking about is that we have, if you look at the sessions that have been done, they have uh, learned a lot from the indigenous approach about um, the movement of different kinds of consciousness and, and what is, um, what can be done with engaging the physical body and that the, you know, kind of miraculous effects of psychedelics and this um, different way of, <coughs> of, of having things come to the surface. Traditional medicine and psychiatry is suppressing symptoms. It's kind of like exaggerating symptoms. So it's like a different direction of therapy. So I think that the individual sessions have a lot of the wisdom of the indigenous, but at the same time, that there are things in the indigenous approach that do prioritize group over individual, but I don't feel that comfortable with. I like, you know, individual rights. Also the power dynamics. And so that's a really important, to the extreme, you have a shaman who takes the drug and who then heals somebody. Now that's good. You want like a surgeon, right? That's a good, you know, I want a surgeon who's like, you know, does it for me, uh, but, but what we're trying to do is the power dynamic is help people heal themselves and that that's this so i think we do have you know ego maniacal therapists you know that their power like i'm the one that's doing all this for you and um you know there's skill and they are have to they, there's a lot to being a therapist but but i think that sometimes the power dynamics in the indigenous context are not so good some of the indigenous contexts like the the ayahuasca churches in brazil in order to survive, they're not really indigenous, they're syncretic churches where they've had to blend with the Catholic church. They are homophobic, hierarchical, patriarchal. You know, so the culture is more important than the psychedelics, which is the, the psychedelic global spirituality, which I talked about, that's in a context, but it's not automatically comes from the drug and you can get it from shooting up in space and being an astronaut or something, you know, but, but the, there's gotta be this, um, sense that um, uh, that that not everything in the indigenous context is the way that it, it translates like neuroscience I'm not sure but it is a translate to the therapeutic setting in the US now as we move towards groups that's where I think that we can learn a lot more from indigenous about that kind of context and I think that what we are going to have to do in a lot of these cultures that are high trauma you know low psychotherapist or psychiatrist or even low concept of trauma or PTSD, a lot of times it manifests as physical ones. So one of the things you can learn as indigenous is this kind of mind, body, physical representation of things. So I think in, in doing PTSD therapy in other cultures or contexts, there's probably gonna be a lot of somatic aspects to it. And that that's, I think, where, where body keeps the score by best of Vanderbilt. We know that from the Western psychiatrists, but that's also big from the indigenous. So I think we owe a debt of gratitude and honor to the, um, sources but uh, i was taught uh, this to, to be a, a basically a reformed jew and what that means is that it's our responsibility to take the texts from the past and reinterpret them to make them relevant today it's not that you just say oh okay right. you know here so uh, I, okay that's a tenure i'm conscious of the time so no no i am yeah, Rick. Um, well, look. Firstly, thank you everyone who's who stayed on for the whole the whole ride, and and thank you for all your support and participation in uh, Mind Medicine Australia. We're very grateful. If you love our webinars, please bring along like three or four people to to the next one and the next one. We've got some amazing webinars coming up. I think Peter previewed some of them, but we've got people like um, oh, uh, who have we got coming up? Uh, Ron Siegel's coming up. Um, Wade Davis is coming up. We've got um, Bissell van der Kolk. And we've really got some incredible people um, who are going to be doing some work with us and doing these webinars with us. And we're really grateful to you, Rick, for presenting and the generosity of your time, your incredible wisdom and insight in this field. I mean, thank you. Please oh, thank give you him so a much. clap. Um, <laughs> we, we love you, you lots. And um, you know, we also encourage people to get involved through our chapters. Um, we've got over 30 chapters around Australia. If, you know, you can be a philanthropist, even a small one, two cups of coffee a week, and you can become a regular donor to Mind Medicine Australia. You can also support MAPS, of course, we do. And um, 
you, we just encourage you all to support whatever support you can do in this space to raise the awareness and to challenge your local members of parliament to really move the needle. Like there is so much desperation and suffering. I don't need to tell any of you about this. I've seen a lot of it in the chat and the comments. We see so many emails and letters a day from people who are suffering unbearably. And if we can help change that, we will do anything we can to, to do so. So we just need your support. We can't do it alone. And um, we just thank you all for your for your great hearts, your great wisdom and insights. And Rick, <clears throat> lots of love. And um, we hope to catch up with you, uh, thank you. Thank you. very soon. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's really important, the training that you're doing. Oh, no, thank you. And thanks for being a teacher on the CPAC course. And just a reminder to everyone, please apply for um, intakes five and six by the end of June. Don't miss out. And if you need financial support, please reach out to us. We'll do our best to help you in any way we can. Yeah. And thank you, Rick, for being being the person you are. It's, uh, yeah, it's really brilliant. brilliant. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a have a good evening. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks everybody.